different speed fine and, and that's have another absolutely shot of absolutely all right let's see oh. it says we're live we are live so uh good evening everyone and for all the uh, fathers out there um happy father's day to you we are coming live uh once again this is the red war round table with emerging red war uh, we have two individuals that are putting their reputation on the line for joining us here uh, so we started first uh, in the bottom left corner of my screen is Scott Hill. He is the Chief of Interpretation and Education at George Washington Birthplace National Alignment and Thomas Stone National Historic Site and had the pleasure of being my supervisor for a number of years. Um, and he still wants to talk to me. So I guess that's uh, a plus there as well. We're also bringing back another historian, uh, Adam Zielinski. Uh, you might've seen him on some of the American Battlefield Trust uh, ones as well. Um, he is a uh, con contracted historian with American Battlefield Trust um, and is a proud native New Jerseyan um, as well. And then, then the bottom right corner, always surprising us with his background, is uh, Emerging Rebel War historian and National Park Service Ranger, Mark Malloy. So gentlemen, uh, thank you for joining. Uh, welcome to the Red War of Revelry. Um, uh, we are getting started here, so. Good evening. Uh, good evening, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's for the drink to be out one. Um, and uh, one of the things uh, is important is that George Washington, we always know the man, the myth, the legend. But he was also considered a father, but he was not the first Washington here in uh, the New World. He actually uh, was the fourth generation of Washington. And so uh, one of the reasons we brought Mr. Hill on board is to uh, talk a little bit about uh, who those fathers of the father of the country was. So um, we'll put him on the spot first here. So do you want to go all the way back oh, to the first Washingtons in Virginia? That would be John Washington, of course. John arriving in 1657 and spending some uh, some time getting to uh, getting to know the locals and it was a good thing that he did. Uh, he met a man named Nathaniel Pope and uh, did enough uh, for Nathaniel that he sa uh, that Nathaniel said, go ahead and marry my daughter. And by the way, I'm going to give you 700 acres of land as a dowry. Not so bad, you know, so a good start there. Uh, don't know all that much about Lawrence. Uh, John's son, uh, John's son um, has among his children, Augustine, and uh, Augustine is only four when Lawrence dies, and then Augustine, George's father, um, he is the one I think that really gets uh, George uh, to think about the power of land, the importance of land um, in Virginia, and so Augustine buys in 1715 150 acres on Pope's Creek, and of course 17 years later that's where George will be born, he also uh, obtains a 150 acre parcel at uh, what we know now as Ferry Farm um, on the, uh, the Thalmouth side, not the Thalmouth side, the Stafford side of the uh, Rappahannock River. So um, George uh, comes from a, uh, you know, a long line of sturdy gentlemen eager to test their mettle in, in this new world and uh, not so new by the time George was born, but um, you know, just really acquiring land, acquiring reputation, and that's where George starts off. So it's it's pretty cool to be at, at the birthplace there. Um, we are, you know, continuing to uncover stories that are quite fascinating. So um, it's it's been a joy to be there, and I look forward to uh, to finding more out before eventually um, I set off on my retirement ways. So. Hey, uh I, I, I got a question. Actually, uh, I went down to the, the birthplace this uh, for the anniversary, George Washington's birthday this year. And it was interesting because they, they, uh, they have the area, I guess, marked out where the house was where he was born. But then I guess they found out that's not the actual site. Um, so is, is work ongoing to try and nail down exactly where the GPS coordinates of where Washington actually <laughs> entered this world. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, absolutely. So I've I've been at the park now for uh, 18 and a half years. I actually did have a little bit of hair on top of here when I got started there, but it all is you know faded away. So yeah, so when I first got there, uh, the foundation on the ground that's about 50 yards away from the Memorial House. Um, that's what people believed was the, uh, the birth house. Uh, they uh, believed that um, the artifacts that they had uncovered there in the 1930s uh, and then a, a future, uh, or excuse me, a, um, a newer uh, archeological project in the 1970s 
both led the historians of the Park Service at the time to say that was it. But we had our cultural resource people, we had archaeologists take a look at the, the record, the archaeological record, and really the, the spot that is outlined there on the ground um, is not it. Um, we don't know exactly what it is. It's probably a composite of a number of buildings built on the same location. Uh, but yeah, we're still working on it because um, even though it, it seems like a long time in the future, it's not really all that long. 2030, the park will be 100 years old. And then of course in 2032, we'll have uh, George's 300th birthday. And if anything, um, if it is anything like the 1932 celebration, uh, we're gonna have thousands and thousands of people show up there. It'd be kind of nice to let them know exactly where George was born by that time. Um, that's my goal. Um, <laughs> and yes, we are, we are still working to uncover it. Um, we're looking to find a lot of other things as well, but uh, that right there is the most important thing to me uh, is to find that location, act, actually be able to say, here you go, this is it. Uh also, just about George's, you mentioned George's background and his family. Uh, I guess how wealthy of a family were the Washingtons and was George? Because we'll get into, I guess, talking about Martha and the rest of his family. But uh, my understanding was, I mean, they were well off, but they weren't, they were not Custis wealth uh, of Virginia at that time. Is that incorrect or is that? No, no, you're, you're absolutely right on. The Washingtons are probably what we would call upper middle class. Um, they are below the level of gentry. I mean, right down the road is Stratford Hall. Uh, the Lees uh, were in the gentry. Uh, the Washingtons were not when, you know, when Stratford Hall was set up in 1738 and George was born in 1732. It was the Lees that had all the wealth and the Washingtons had a lot of land. I mean, Augustine was, uh, he was a mover and a shaker. He was trying to get things done. Uh, unfortunately, he, like the other Washington males before him all passed before age 50. And so it was very difficult for uh, him to, to add on to that. But it is interesting to note then that, you know, George Washington and Light Horse Harry Lee um, will become very close during the revolution. Light Horse Harry Lee uh, will get Stratford Hall. And then uh, some of the bad mistakes that Light Horse Harry Lee makes with his finances causes him to lose Stratford Hall and move uh, his son and family uh, up to Alexandria, your neck of the woods, Mark, and, uh, you know, there to, to live out the, the, the squalid life in that, in that terrible, you know, <laughs> building there. I, you know, it's a great house, but I mean, when you're talking Stratford Hall and, and the Alexandria building, not quite sure that the place in Alexandria quite measures up. <laughs> one of the other, um, and talking about one of the other things that started me working a few years at the birthplace was uh, also the titles on the gravestones. So from an early age, uh, Washington's uh, I mean, forefathers had what colonel, major, or captain or whatever on the gravestone. So, um, and then you can argue that his, after all this thing, his biggest fatherly figure was probably um, Lawrence Washington, who uh, took him under his wing. And Lawrence also had a um, uh, military uh, career, so to speak. I mean, I think he was what on the ship when they fired into uh, Cartagena. Um, a few years ago, I actually had a chance to visit Cartagena and, and the for and the fortress he was at, uh, supposedly. And I mean, it is even today, it is an impressive stone structure there in Columbia. Um, I kind of did a de facto George Washington tour of outside the country, um, convincing the people I was with that were doing it to go on a cruise to see the Caribbean, but it happened to go to places like Barbados and Cartagena, it just happened to be. So, um, and it's Barbados maybe shapes Washington as the father, uh, kind of plays all that father figure because they believe what, smallpox there in uh, the time when he's 19 might have added to sterility. Um, but uh, there's a nice, for all, you, for all the interpreters watching, and I know we have a few interpreter park rangers and guides here on uh, as well. There's the greatest interpreter mark about George Washington is in Barbados. And when you walk to the house, it says, we saved Washington before he saved the United States. So <laughs> I don't know, uh, yeah. anyone can make that claim more than Barbados who got him sick and then saved him. So <laughs> yeah, so I just wanted to throw that out there um, as we move forward into talking about um, what, what shapes Washington, I mean, as, as a father, what's the biggest influence you think is it his mother is it his brother 
Is it that he tries to balance between two of them? I'm going to throw that out there as a question, as a influence, because usually it's the father that shapes um, in colonial American society, but he's not there. Uh, I'll go first. Um, one thing I always found fascinating about Washington in that regard is he was very much largely self-educated. And the fact that he didn't go to university like much of or many of his peers, uh, as Scott just said, like, you know, he wasn't considered part of the uh, Virginia upper class at that time. Um, and he wasn't equal uh, in, you know, uh, studies like Jefferson and Madison or other people uh, of the age, you know, later on. So he kind of has a chip on his shoulder and it shows throughout many of his, you know, early endeavors, you know, obviously we know the story of how he wanted to join the, uh, the Royal Navy and his mom said no. Um, so he became a surveyor instead because this was land-based and it allowed him to really get out and see the, uh, the country, you know, the Western country at the time, which was essentially Western PA, Ohio, and uh, you know, what is essentially West Virginia and, and whatnot. But it really shaped Washington in the sense where, yeah, he didn't have the book smarts, you know, per se, but he was smart and he was, you know, he allowed himself to really dive into subjects that interest him, but also he physically put himself in certain situations. So he was forced to learn by, you know, experience. And that's something that really does set him apart from virtually everybody else that he would rub shoulders with later in American history. Whereas these guys spent much of their careers, you know, either in law offices or, you know, in, um, in state assemblies or whatnot, even though Washington did serve briefly in the Virginia uh, assembly there before the, the war, you know, he had all this experience going in that was unlike everybody else that, you know, he was around. And I think, you know, we can get into maybe if there was any jealousy on part of other people, but, you know, he, he was very, you know, he cultivated his personality from an early age. And you see that by the actions that he took from an early age. And I'm not saying he perceived himself to be future leader of a country or whatnot, but yeah, the, the things that he just happened to do because school wasn't the option for him, it really built him as a person that other people of the age couldn't, you know, claim to even be his equal in. So, yeah. And another I mean, uh, influence too is you see it later on, um, and jumping a gun a little bit about who some of his staff officers is during the Red War. Um, and a few of them had lost fathers at a very early age mm -hmm. or had did not know their father at all. Uh, Alexander Hamilton, who's, uh, I mean, was born, what, a, a bastard or whatnot in uh, St. Nevis. Um, Marquis de Lafayette, whose father died um, in the French Indian War, I think, at Minden uh, by a British artillery shell. Um, now, yeah, John Lawrence's father was uh, uh, right down with Henry Lawrence, but uh, I mean, John was almost polar opposites in his view on abolitionism and everything else. Um, so you have that gravitation of just those guys as well. Um, and I mean, you have, uh, I mean, I think uh, I'll wade in and say, yes, I mean, Lawrence for all his, uh, I mean, paved the way into, I mean, those connections um, and paved the, um, so the balance. Him and reading up as much as you try to through Chernow and other ones, try to figure out the, um, what Mary Ball's personality was like. And she, I think, always gets a short shift uh, with it. But, I mean, she was a very strong-willed, determined person. I think they gave some of that mental makeup to Washington, uh, whether he liked it or not. Um, the bad temper, how to control it, <laughs> or the force limit, or even maybe that survival gene. I mean, how many people she buried in her life and how she was, I think, what, orphaned at an early age, if I remember correctly. Uh, it's been a few years since I went over my notes for uh, um, the Washington lineage, um, just for reviewing quickly tonight. Um, but, yeah, uh, Phil, just to add, just to add one brief part to what yeah. I was getting at there is, you know, because he doesn't have a father figure and Lawrence is pretty much it, the father figure that he wished he had, especially in that critical period, you know, between 11 years old and up until like his, you know, late teens there. It also shows that because he lacks a father figure, he turns to something that is often overlooked. He turns to philosophy and Washington becomes a practitioner of stoicism. And, you know, that really shapes him for the rest of his life, as you're just saying, you know, he, he, you know, he writes down those, uh, the rules of, you know, how to live and, and all that kind of stuff. But he really starts kind of shaping 
you know, he, he has the forethought to, to say, like, I need to be a better person I, and I have to find a way to be that person. And obviously, you know, that's that just ties right into why he looked at, at the military as a way for him to improve himself where he thought he was lacking. Um, but, yeah, I mean, he it is really interesting seeing how he does turn to philosophy at an early age and he gets into stoicism. And I mean, obviously, as we'll probably, you know, get, uh, get into rather, you know, he really does come to embody Cincinnati in so many ways, but he really does take that story and that, that individual's uh, uh, actions during the Roman, he takes that to heart and he really does try to live, you know, that's the bar he sets for himself. And it's almost like the stories and the philosophy behind those stories that becomes the measure of a man that he unfortunately was lacking in a father figure. So and I think uh, also uh, important in his upbringing with the lack of a, a father. Again, his father dies when he's 11, I believe. And, uh, you know, Lawrence kind of steps in and, uh, and, well, and Lawrence was up at what is today Mount Vernon, um, which is named after Admiral Edward Vernon, who Lawrence served under. Uh, and uh, he also uh, would spend a lot of time with the Fairfax family um, at nearby Belvoir. Uh, which is today where Fort Belvoir is. And this is on my bucket list that one of these times I want to be able to get onto the base so I can go see the actual, it's not no longer there, but there's ruins of the house that was once there uh, that burned down actually during the Revolutionary War. Uh, but, uh, but Washington would spend a lot of time there with the Fairfax family kind of learning, you know, how to uh, act in this, uh, you know, upper class um, and, uh, you know, the definitions of service and all these other kinds of things. Um, and there's a whole real interesting anecdote, too, of uh, uh, when he uh, fell in love with uh, one of the Fairfax's uh, <laughs> wives, uh, Sally Fairfax. Um, you know, and there's, there's a lot been written about. It. It's kind of interesting, uh, but some say, you know, she may have actually helped save the, uh, the whole revolution and American independence by, uh, you know, rejecting Washington. <laughs> Um, but uh, he still maintained a friendship with the Fairfaxes, which is interesting because they become loyalists. And even throughout the American Revolution, while they're fighting this bloody war for independence, Washington still stays in touch with them. Uh, and I think that that kind of shows you the personal affection he had for that family and how important that was and in part of his becoming a man, uh, so to speak. So. I would agree with, with both you, uh, Mark and Adam. Um, one thing I think that, uh, that George also appreciates about Lawrence's life is, you know, the easy access to these people of power and the Fairfaxes, you know, he is learning under, under Lawrence, you know, because Lawrence is married into that clan. This is a clan that, um, you know, owns many acres up in, in what's now Northern Virginia. Um, I mean, I think George really, really appreciates this. Um, but I think that one person that uh, most historians leave out when they're talking about George's upbringing is the middle brother, Augustin Jr., uh, or Gus, as they called him. So Gus takes over Pope's Creek after um, Augustine's death in 1743. George Washington, the first paid position that he has is as a surveyor. Okay? So he gets to understand uh, the value of land, you know, so at 17, he's a paid surveyor at Culpeper County. At 17, I'm barely able to, to drive. I just got my driver's license. I'm like holding down a $3 an hour job. And George, you know, he's a, he's a county surveyor. And so he learns the appreciation of land, I think, from both. He learns the, um, <laughs> how should I say, he learns what he wants. He wants the kind of life that Lawrence is living. Lawrence is living at a house that he's able to uh, to, to build up from what it had been when Augustine was there. Um, he builds it up, he names it for that, Ed, uh, for Edward Vernon, who I think it's, um, wow, I don't know why you would name it for a person that, you know, 60% of the force that you came over there with uh, doesn't make it back to Virginia. Not quite sure that I would name uh, my house after that person. I might name my burial ground after that person. <laughs> Probably not my house though, but, you know, I think both uh, Lawrence and Augustine Jr. give George something to look up to and something to, uh, you know, try to attain. And I, I think he does. And, and 
Um, yes, it's sad that, uh, that Augustine dies, but he has those two male figures. And then as Phil said, he has his mother and his mother does get a bad rap. And I think part of that bad rap is due to the fact that in 18th century, uh, women did not stay unmarried. I mean, she's got this land that, uh, you know, she inherits after, George, after uh, Augustine's death. And yet for 46 years, she's unmarried. And that is very rare in 18th century uh, America, 18th century Virginia in particular. So I think he gets a, a you know, uh, a good dose of, of what George Washington becomes from all three of those players, not just Lawrence. Yeah, I mean, your point, sadly, I mean, stays, I mean, center focus. One, uh, it's also shaded out is the other siblings. I mean, we always, uh, Washington is, well, one of 10 children, I think I remember all together, but I think the first and the oldest both die in infancy, Butler and Jane from the uh, student marriage. But he has younger brother or younger brothers and sisters. And, um, I mean, he does take uh, kind of that fatherly figure for some of them, I mean, especially John uh, Augustine, I think, uh, is his closest. Um, who dies of a brain hemorrhage or something in 1780s. I think he dies uh, young as well. I mean, carrying on that Washington tradition of not uh, living older. Um, then Charles and, is it, uh, I forget the other name of this other brother, but they both move out to what is now. Samuel. 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 Yeah, right? Yeah, that's uh, my name, Samuel Washington. Really, so. <laughs> uh, uh, that, uh, I think Samuel's the, uh, what, alcoholic, I think, or, or is it Charles? One of them becomes, uh, they believe, uh, more of an alcoholic and dies um, as well. But, I mean, Washington... Well, Washington, you know, Washington, uh, Washington all of them, right? All of his uh, siblings? Yeah, the one to die, I think, uh, prior to him is uh, Betsy, the, uh, the sister, right? She died sometime in late 1790s, I think. Yeah. Is, right? yeah. Uh, who goes down in history as the, um, no, uh, what did he say? If she wore a cloak and a hat, she could have walked through the continental camp and been uh, mistaken as George Washington, which is probably not the most endearing. <laughs> so, the Washington women, the mother and the, and the daughter, do not uh, fare well in the, uh, in the histories, unfortunately. They need their image revitalized. Um, well, but well, I, think, I, I think all these family members dying so early, I think that really also, Washington was always aware of that. He was always aware that he had a short time on this earth and he had to make the most of it. And I think that also helped him, you know, his uh, bravery on the battlefield or whatever. I, I, you know, you know, when he's very young, I mean, it's just amazing, like how much, yeah, active stuff he's doing as a young early 20s, you know, out in the French and Indian War and pr right prior to that as well. Um, but then always constantly exposing himself in battle. Um, but yeah, I think he was always he always was aware that the the Grim Reaper was just uh, just a short ways away. So I think he wanted to do everything he had to do in his. Uh, it's amazing how much he did accomplish in just sixty seven years, anyways. So. And you know, I I always get uh, I always find it interesting. Yes, uh, while the males had died before age fifty, when he's at Yorktown, he's almost fifty years old. He's about four months away from his fiftieth birthday, and I just wonder if. Um, once Yorktown is, is won, he's victorious and all that. I wonder if he just in the back of his mind is like, okay, well, you know, if I don't live to 50 now, at least I have accomplished something very significant here. Um, and of course, yes, he does go on for another 18 years and had uh, medical practitioners um, actually uh, spoken to and learned from other medical practitioners. He might have survived even later. Uh, Dr. Dick, uh, who worked or who lived in Alexandria, mm -hmm. who proposed that radical new treatment of the tracheotomy, and instead, Gustavus uh, Richard Brown and James Craig say, "No, you'll kill him." And sure enough, they do. You know, so uh, you know, I always just find that interesting, fascinating. Every time I walk on the Yorktown battlefield, I just think, "Wow, it's just what is going through his mind as as this campaign, as he knows that this campaign is coming closer and closer to." To victory so uh i i think uh, what you say there too i i see it in his writings right in between you know resigning his commission from the army and becoming president of the constitutional convention and then president of the united states you know he keeps talking about yeah i'm going down to you know down to to be with my fathers like like he's all, he's basically accepted yeah like I, i'm sure i got just a couple of years left which then i think makes him getting involved with the constitution convention and him getting involved be president that much more amazing that he was willing to sacrifice uh, his reputation, everything he had worked for his whole life, 
uh, to go on this experiment of uh, of this uh, constitutional convention in the in the federal government because uh, it looks like you know it, and had he died at any point in that process uh, whether you know it was during the constitution or during the uh, while he was president uh, it could have radically changed uh, how America operates today because then it, the precedent would be you become president till you die um, or whatever else I mean it's just the it's just amazing because his second retirement from the presidency is that important as well to the, the uh, letting go of power is just, uh, it's so unheard of in world history that it's so amazing that this one guy did it not once, but twice. So. <laughs> yeah. One of the, uh, so I want to throw this in a side note, but it's, uh, we've been talking about, um, I mean, his family being sickly and then him as well, a little bit being sick. And we hear about, I mean, obviously in his teenage years, Barbados, he's sick. Trenton in the war, I mean, on the way to Monongahela, I think is it he's sick, or with Forbes, he's one of them sick. I think it's Monongahela, he's sick. And then you hear it on his presidency. I mean, he's drastically sick in uh, New York City. Um, but you don't hear anything during the Red War about him being, I mean, I wonder if they just hit it, or does anyone know? I mean, I'm just trying to uh, think right now. I mean, you read about the Morristown and the, and the Valley Forge, is you don't hear anything about him even having a head cold. And then, I mean, in Yorktown is what um, stepson passes away shortly after contracting camp fever. So that's just what brought it up. Here's a guy who is very sensitive to his short time of life, but during the defining moment that makes him the father of the country, winning the revolution, you don't hear anything about him having a head cold or anything during seven years. I mean, unless somebody- uh, I wonder if it's- I wonder if it's because the people closest around him were very protective of him and very protective of, you know, his reputation, but obviously of him personally, because, I mean, we all know all the different plots that were trying to unseat him as commander in chief of the army, you know, you know, all the cabals, all, everybody, like everybody had an ax to grind with Washington having command. We're well, not everybody, but you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I, I think, I think it's not unreasonable to speculate that, you know, the people closest to him, his, all of his aides to the camps and all that, they were very guarded of him. And I think you're right. It, it, because nothing has come out suggesting that he had a major sickness at any time during the war, is it possible he was healthy the whole time? Yeah, it's possible. But it's more, in my opinion, it's more likely that if he did come down with something, they were not going to write about it or they weren't going to let it slip away from his, you know, cl close quarters there in camp because – just the whispers of Washington potentially being, you know, gravely ill, regardless, maybe he just had a head cold, like you said, Phil, but all it takes is rumor to spread that he is gravely ill. You know, that could completely flip the morale in, in uh, the Continental Army camp at the time. And that's obviously what they didn't want to do. No, you're right. I was just thinking, I mean, after the war, after he's dead, I mean, so much is written about him and I mean, right. his life and this and notes, I mean, David Humphrey's biography, who don't know, I think it's David Humphrey's who doesn't finish it, but he also has, I think, Dr. Mead, Kitter, Ripper Kidder Mead, um, and other doctors. I mean, a part of that staff, you think afterwards, I mean, it would sell to have something about Washington. Like, hey, I saved Washington during the revolution because he got sick as a dog here or whatnot. I mean, even in this, I uh, hate to bring up that recent unpleasantness or the Civil War because that might make our comment section go ballistic right now but <laughs> made it, uh, there's a running joke from uh, that how long can you make it in an ERW roundtable before the Civil War is mentioned um, and uh, I beat Mark there so um, uh, I'm proud of myself or not but I mean you hear about Robert Lee being sick during the war and uh, I mean Samuel Jackson might be sick at Chancellorsville but so yeah you hear about that afterwards about some of these things being brought up about these famous leaders and you just would think that if something drastic somebody one of the staff officers or something might have made a little money off a book saying, hey, I saved Washington during the revolution when he was sick. So, yeah. Well, there uh, is a story. There is one story. I, I think I'm getting the, the year right. I, I, obviously, it's Washington, but Washington was on his horse and the horse threw him off. I think the horse had uh, thrown a shoe and it took a bad step and he went tumbling down and he landed like on his hip and he got immediately up. And he climbed back on the horse and like, you know, like nothing had happened, but it was like in front of everybody. And that goes kind of against what we've all been told about Washington being this immaculate horseman who essentially nothing bad ever happened to him while sitting in the saddle of a horse. So it's like, you know, how much of it is true and how much of it isn't. And yeah, there, so 
he's he's just as human as anybody. You know, he literally got thrown off his horse at one point. So those stories probably do exist, but like you said, for whatever reason, they're they're just not really in the historical record. Yeah. And I, you know, I mean, especially during this time of uh, COVID, it's interesting because, you know, you go to the grocery store and somebody sneezes and it's like, oh my goodness. Uh, can you imagine the Valley Forge encampment where people are dying off left and right from disease? And yeah, God forbid, you know, wash and start coughing or something like that. I mean, I mean, I just wonder how much, you know, we kind of do it in our lifestyle today where you, in your mind, you kind of go to the worst possible scenario sometimes of like, and I wonder if people are around Washington. Yeah. And he started coughing and they thought, Oh my gosh, does he have typhus? Is he going to, is he going to die? Um, you know, but yeah, you don't really, I don't really see a lot of that in historic record. I mean, like you said, it might be because it was guarded. Um, but I, I just think that it's, uh, you know, for the real people, they must have really thought been fearful because of disease uh, was so prevalent because so many people died so young uh, and it was kind of all around them all the time I mean I just imagine you must have been people must have been anxious all the time that like and maybe you know that explains yeah, like I said like that people back then were much more religious were much more uh, understanding of death uh, death was just much more regular part of life but um, being that Washington ended up being so indispensable I think it's uh uh, people must have been terrified if he and I think that uh, you talk about Barbados I think that's you know him getting uh, smallpox uh, and having survived it I think that you know making him immune uh, you know was very important for making sure he didn't get smallpox during the war and die from it so mm -hmm. um, but like you mentioned and we can go back to this in a second but uh, did that make it impossible for him to have children and I think it's interesting one of the reasons why I decided to have this Father's Day um, uh, session on George Washington is he is the father of the country. But one of the most ironic things is, yeah, he has no children of his own. Um, and, uh, and I think that ultimately that ended up being a great thing for the country because again, it set this precedent that, you know, if there was a George Washington Jr. Uh, who then ended up becoming president, uh, you know, or head of the army or whatever, it could very much set up an American nobility or something along those lines that uh, uh, could be very dangerous to the whole experiment. So uh, ultimately, you know, the United States was his child. Um, but yeah, why couldn't he have the child? Was it because of smallpox? I've also heard because he rode horses. I heard maybe it's something with Martha because Martha, she had four children. Um, but, you know, something might have happened that she couldn't conceive after that. Who knows? Um, but I think him not being able to have children ended up playing an important role in the American experiment as well. Yeah, absolutely. So we, uh, so we got him up. Uh, so he's not sick during the Red, uh, Red War. Um, obviously, politics will make anybody sick. Um, just look at the news uh, today. Um, but um, when do, uh, what was the question? When does, when does he really become the father of the country? Is it after the Red War? Is it when he comes out of retirement at the Constitution Convention? Or is it something posthumously that, so... I, there's no right answer here. I'm throwing it out for a nice little uh, historical debate here. When does George Washington, in your mind, become the father of the country? Um, I'll just, I, I want to preface this too. I think it's interesting because when you study the actual historic record, from the time of uh, the, the battle of Braddock's defeat during the French and Indian War, uh, he survives that battle and some newspaper reporter, or a, a, it was a reverend actually, it was written in the newspaper report, said that it was amazing that Washington had survived and helped lead the retreat of the survivors. And it said it was as if Providence had saved this man for something great uh, in the future or something along those lines. So I think like, and then you read after the battles of Trenton and Princeton, uh, you know, I found a quote from like a, a Pennsylvania newspaper saying, you know, that this guy uh, was God incarnate. I mean, he was, uh, you know, if he had any defects, they were like uh, the spots on the sun that you couldn't see unless you had a, a, a telescope. Uh, it was just, uh, I think, from a very early period, Washington was already being kind of groomed for this role, so to speak, of people attaching a lot of uh, symbolism on him. And I think he even realized it while he was, you know, even as he was going through his life. Um, and I think that's why he's so 
uh, as Adam was saying earlier, uh, stoic um, and very guarded with how he, his outward uh, appearance, because I think he knew as in the, the Hamilton musical says, history has its eyes on you. I think he really much knew that, uh, that history is watching every step he had, because I think, so I would say, I would say, uh, you know, he became the father of the country probably during the revolution, uh, you know, once power solidified around him. Mm. Um, but, uh, but I think from a very early age, all the way when he was in the French Indian War, people were already projecting greatness on him. Before anyone else comes in, I just want to say now, uh, the drinking, the RW drinking game is when the Civil War gets mentioned and when Mark mentions Hamilton, the play or, or the musical. Watching <laughs> <laughs> at home, we've mentioned both of them uh, right now. So it's just the uh, insight there. So Adam Scott, what, or whoever wants to take it next? I think, honestly, it was his resonation in Annapolis. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to steal that for this guy. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, that's a, that was exactly what I was going with. Yeah. yeah, but I think that was the one defining moment, you know? I mean, a person who has power that, you know, no other American has had, and he willingly lays it down and goes back to his farm. Um, and it's it's just, yeah, I, I think, and I agree with you, Mark, it's, it is interesting. It does seem like this is a person that's destined for greatness. I mean, you know, he's got holes shot through, uh, clothing and you know he is really leading this you know beaten and 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 bloody to a pulp uh, British American force back from Monongahela and you know I just see though that that resignation just really does it because once he lays down his arms I think the politicians say well okay so this guy he's not going to grasp for power he's not going to take anything that um, you know other countries might have done. Um, he, you know, the Mount Vernon conference, which gets very little airplay usually in March of 1785 when Virginia and Maryland, probably the only time that it's ever happened in their history and probably the only time that it ever will happen. Um, Virginia and Maryland work out an equitable, you know, uh, trade uh, or, or, you know, usage of the Potomac River. Um, and, you know, George is not a, an official participant in the Mount Vernon conference, but I just think his presence um, you know, kind of drives these commissioners, including Thomas Stone, my, my second park over in outside of the plate of Maryland. Um, so I think that um, is, is very uh, key to, to Washington's greatness. Again, he didn't ask to be the president of the Constitutional Convention. They basically said, come on out and, and do this. He didn't ask to be the first president, but they said, look, come on out and do this. I think, you know, it built up during the war. I think if any of those cabals, as Adam had mentioned, had succeeded, um, you know, if Charles Lee or Horatio Gates, by God, um, had led the army, I mean, you know, we're, we're talking a different tune here. We're, we're singing, you know, God save the queen. There's no, you know, don't put anything behind those two guys. But I think George, you know, gaining through uh, the victory at Yorktown, holding the army together through mutinies, you know, through lack of payment, I'm, all of this stuff, I think in 1783, they're like, okay. This is, this is the guy. He is the father of our country. He's the guy that's going to uh, control whatever this experiment becomes. Sorry, Adam. No, hey, you said it better than I could have said. I'll, I'll drink to that. Um, <laughs> just to add to that real quick, I was going to say, it really, the reason, what may, many of the reasons, obviously, but one of the reasons that made me think of Annapolis is, you know, had Washington just had done that and surprised everybody, I don't think the impact would have had the same lasting power that it did. And what I'm, the reason why I'm saying that and what I mean by that is everybody who was close to Washington in the army had been saying for years when asked, well, what does he plan on doing when he, if he wins the war? Is he going to you know, become a dictator? Is he going to be, you know, and literally everybody who was close to him said, no, he's probably going to go home to Mount Vernon. And I mean, like, so Washington made it known to the people closest to him in the army what his intentions were. So when he did resign in, in uh, December of 83, those same people turned around and said, I told you so. Like, this guy is a man of integrity. He's, he told us years ago he was going to walk away when this thing's all over with. And look, he did it. So by that right there, by example, but also by proving that his word actually meant something, I think that really is what solidified that legacy. And like I said, had he had just done it like on a whim, it would not have had the same impact because there, you know, the people would be questioning his motives. Like, 
well, why did he do that today? What's he planning for tomorrow? Whereas now you don't have that speculation because again, you have all these people around saying, he said from day one, he was going to go back to Mount Vernon and, and work his farms. You know, he, he was only in this to essentially, you know, for independence and that was it. So like Mark said, and like we've all said, that really isn't just another layer to why he was the indispensable person because there's so many people in it for all, like you just said, Gates, Lee, whoever, there's so many people in it for other motives, other reasons. Whereas Washington was really only in it for, yes, his reputation, of course, but he was really only in it for independence. And as soon as that objective was uh, uh, won and achieved, he wanted to go home and his actions came to define that in the end. Yeah. And I, I think also, yeah, when you look at world history, you look at Caesar, you look at Cromwell, you look at Napoleon, you look at all these other people that were in somewhat similar situations uh, as Washington. Uh, they seized their power when they had the moment. Uh, and Washington has that moment uh, and gives that up. And yeah, I agree. I think that was, that was an incredibly important moment. And had he died, and had Washington died in 1784 before everything else have happened, yeah, I mean, American history, obviously, God knows what would have happened leading up to a potential, you know, convention to figure out what to do with the article, articles there. But had he died right after uh, the war ended, giving up power and all that, I think his reputation would be very similar to what it currently is. Because I, I going back to what we were saying, like, just that act alone was so important because it had never been done before in modern history that whether he intended it to be or not in my opinion that is what defines george washington in my opinion in american history is just the relinquishing of power and that the military will not be in control of the government and the actions of the government it would be vice versa so you know that legacy you know he owns that better than anything else in his life so. Yeah, he, uh, uh, King George the Third, said it the best when he heard that Washington was going to do that. He said, "If he does that, he will be the greatest man in the world." Uh, I think that's true. Now, for Washington though to get to that moment, though, I think uh, uh, his finest moment, though, in my opinion, though, too, is memorialized uh, in the statue you see behind me. This is a, a monument to George Washington. Monuments, of course, in the news recently. This one is still standing there in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, and this depicts Washington at what I uh, believe to be his finest moment. And that was at the Battle of Princeton uh, when Washington's army was uh, in retreat. Washington rides to the front, rallies the troops, uh, rides right up into the British lines, uh, is 30 yards away in between the British and American lines on both sides fire volleys, uh, smoke envelops the scene, nobody can see anything. And when the smoke disappears, there's Washington unscathed in between the lines. Uh, I think his victory, his, his personal bravery in battle this, that we saw from Braddock's defeat all the way up through the entire war, but really on display at the Battle of Princeton, uh, formed this uh, bond with his men, that his men would never leave him. Uh, I mean, these 3,000 guys that stuck with him through that uh, winter of uh, 1776, 1777, that helped save the whole United States. If Washington in 1783 decided he wanted to seize power, he had an army that would follow him. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think that's important to know that because of his personal actions, his personal bravery, people were willing to follow him into hell itself uh and uh and, and they just they displayed that during during the battles but this is a monument that you know was built in 1860 in washington dc to memorialize this moment of washington one of my favorite washington monuments in the entire country is in baltimore if you go to baltimore you'll see a big huge statue of washington and what is at the very top of that not a horseback washington riding into battle but Washington just standing there holding a piece of paper in his hand. It's Washington resigning his commission there at Annapolis, uh, memorializing that moment of giving up power and how important that was. So uh, obviously there, there, there have been you know, dozens and dozens of Washington monuments that have gone up all over the country. Uh, and they, di they memorialize different aspects of his character and what he did. But I think the Baltimore one really hits on uh, that resignation of power and how important that was. Right, and jumping in uh, first, uh, Mark, is there any good books on that uh, Trenton, Princeton campaign? <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> uh, he usually has a book somewhere near him, so uh, there it is. It, uh, 
Oh. Yeah. Uh, I still want my signed copy. <laughs> and it's also nice to hear my hometown get some good news. Um, Mount, it's, uh, I think it's Mount Vernon Place. Um, definitely visit. It also has, I hate to say, now go back into the Civil War a little bit, but it's also supposedly where the uh, headquarters for the uh, district is. Apparently, Lou Wallace has a house. Uh, his headquarters is near that monument, uh, okay. where the monument is, um, before the Battle of Monocacy uh, in 1864. Um, but um, I like to jump in about uh, one of the things that uh, spending, I think, about seven years at George Washington Birthplace, um, obviously growing up in uh, Maryland, um, working at Thomas Stone, uh, one of the proud rangers that have worked there. Uh, there's only a few that can say that, right, Scott? Um, yeah, that's absolutely correct. One of the things uh, that I think we always try to figure out, like, when did Washington become this? Or when did Washington become a revolutionary? Or when did Washington know he was going to give up tyrant? And it's just... He's the one of those guys that's amazing, just that human aspect of it, where we're never going to know precisely when that light bulb switched that, hey, I'm done. I mean, you can see there's there's traces of it and everything. And uh, we always try to point, this is the turning moment, like the straw that broke the camel's back. And I think Washington is a perfect example of that history is not that straightforward. There's not the one defining moment. We always like turning points or the high water mark or something. But no, it's um, what do you do in that specific situation? And Washington, uh, leading that, Washington builds up that case where you look, even before the war is over, um, he's given extreme power, what is it, during um, the uh, right before Trenton Princeton, when the yeah. Continental Congress leaves Philadelphia. Extreme powers, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and he gives it back. Um, he, he uh, I mean, is frustrated beyond belief throughout uh, multiple times. I mean, the Valley Fords, I mean, and uh, could have just given up and yeah, you know what? Or Asia Gates wants it, let him come out here to Valley Forge and hang out. Um, or when he reads a letter between what um, Gates and uh, and Joseph Reed, or Lee and Joseph Reed, and they're blasting him, that yeah, he doesn't yeah. just go haywire then. Or at Newburgh, one of his greatest speeches that uh, gets un uh, not appreciated. So Washington, at every point when he had a chance to take power or assume more, not only does he give it back, but I mean, he he is a track record. So, I mean, I think the father of the country shows that by the time, I mean, of the Constitution, he has set that precedent that, hey, it, but it's also, once again, he's tested the biggest hurdle um, of giving it up. Uh, just going to the Constitution, I mean, is an amazing feat that they actually get him out of retirement. Um, although he says he likes Mount Vernon, I do believe that he always found a way to get out of Mount Vernon. So I'm not sure if uh, that was more Martha pushing him out the door, like, you know what? It's been fun having you home, but I also like when you go away. So, um, but no, that's just speculation. But no, um, I always, and that's, and the last thing that I'll add, and then we can um, go to closing remarks, et cetera, is the last part of uh, Light Horse Harry Lee's speech about Washington. He's first in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen, but second to none. Um, and I think that second part um, also plays a major part because who else had that ability? Um, to, um, to kind of ratify, to stay above party politics. I mean, he could have said in 1793, hey, um, I'm gone. And he was asked to stay on as president. And then he gets blasted by Jefferson and, and the press and on both sides. And he never says, you know what? It was Thomas Jefferson actually told me to stay. And then he reneged on his deal and walked out the back door. He's even above that political fray um, and so forth. So those are uh, just a few random points of- Well, we uh, talked about it. We talked about it, Phil, in the one Zoom meeting um, with uh, his presidency, and I just got done reading. I can't remember which one of the, it is. I think it's actually called Washington, but it talks about you know the uh, building of the Capitol during the 1790s, and it makes a really strong case for that is the sole reason why Washington takes a second term is because the Capitol city was in such shambles with financing that Washington was terrified that if he walked away after one term and pretty much nothing had been, no ground had been broken on the Capitol, it would never get completed and the South would lose the capital city. So uh, it's interesting to see like if that really was a motivator for him, the real, I mean, obviously he knew his name was gonna be attached to the capital city when it was done. So going back to, you know, him of all things, considering his legacy and reputation chief of, you know, among everything, it, it makes you wonder if that really was a motivator for him. Like we, like you just said, like, yeah, I mean, people were making promises to him saying you have to come back a second time. And he's like, I don't really want to. Maybe that was the, the real reason because he was like, well, I don't want to see this project in the Potomac go, you know, go to nothing. 
because there was no guarantee that the city was going to be completed by 1800. And if it didn't get completed, they punted the, the capital city in Washington would never get built. And then they would go back to square one. And, you know, would Philadelphia get the permanent seat? Would Lancaster PA that was uh, vying for it before uh, the Potomac was chosen, would they get another shot at it? So it's, it's interesting, you know, all the other moving chairs that are happening behind the scenes there. Great point. So as we move uh, toward, yeah, I'm glad you actually brought up a point. Um, we, uh, there's so many books on Washington. Um, I mean, second probably to Lincoln as one of his most written about uh, presidents, or maybe I'm making a fault, written about presidents before the turn of the uh, 1900s, we'll say it that way. Because um, I know once you get into the 20th century, FDR, Teddy, all of them have multiple tomes out to them. But um, what's that one book you would recommend to read uh, about Washington, especially putting in the context of what we talked about today, not so much the military one, but getting a little bit of who Washington was, maybe his father's, maybe um, a little bit of his family. So um, who wants to take the lead on the first book? I'll, I got mine right here. Realistic Visionary, Peter Henriquez, I think is fascinating if you want to kind of like get a deep dive into who Washington was. Uh, it's not a it's not a full length biography, but it kind of takes like some of the more interesting aspects of his life uh, and does a deep dive into them. Um, and uh, so, if you want to kind of get a you know, it's called a portrait because uh, it kind of like paints a picture of him. Uh, whether it's his views on slavery, whether it's his relationship with Martha, which you know, again, we never have enough time on these things because it could go on and on and on. But I think I think his whole marriage with Martha is a uh, is a fascinating uh, story in itself. Uh, whether it's uh, you know, kind of goes into all these different things. And Peter Enrique, he's a great, he's a great author. It's a great, great book, uh, especially if you're just looking for a, a small tome. If you if you really want to dive deep, Douglas Southall Freeman, seven volumes. That's the one to go to. So, <laughs> <laughs> hey, Phil, do you remember? Um... In, in Dr. Henrike's class that uh, we reviewed that book as it was going along. You remember that? Yeah, so okay. it's, it's definitely. Copy, but, we, I didn't get a what was that? How people would read that book. I thought we'd get a free copy or something. I did too. Something, acknowledgement in the book or, you know, just something. But no, no, you guys are free. You guys just give your uh, <laughs> give your input and then thank you and, and, and no thank you. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. There are things wrong with it, um, but I actually do like Chernow's Washington. I'm not sure that it's my favorite. I think Freeman, even though you know Freeman's historiography is not, I mean, it, there's some there's some challenges there. But I I really like Chernow. I, I was there uh, at Mount Vernon about four months after he released the book, and you know I thought he did an excellent job of explaining you know how he chose to write that book on Washington and how um, he, he reviewed, you know, hundreds of books. Mm -hmm. He talked to, yeah, that's the one he, I mean, he did so many things that I think that other authors on Washington or either, you know, Lincoln or, or, you know, whoever um, failed to do. I think he did his due diligence and then went above the due diligence to, to find out any little layer that he could. Um, so it might not be my favorite, but I think it's probably my, my most impactful Washington title out there. Fair enough. Adam? Um, I have a, a ton of Washington books in front of me because I'm actually doing work for the trust right now on a upcoming uh, Washington thing. So, um, so I have everything out. So that's why when Mark hit me up, I was like, yeah, I could talk about Washington. It's not like I'm not <laughs> thinking about him nonstop anyway. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I have uh, this, uh, it's one by uh, Gary Wills, uh, Cincinnatus, and it really goes into kind of what I touched on earlier about, um, you know, the philosophy that went into Washington, um, you know, from an early age, but just how he carried himself as an adult and, and throughout all everything he did in his life, how, uh, you know, he was, as many of them were, he was a true man, the Enlightenment. And he was shaped by, you know, the 18th century through and through. And in return, he shaped the 18th century through his actions. And um, it's just a fascinating book. Um, Wills also wrote a really good one on Lincoln talking about the Gettysburg Address. And I, I definitely recommend that one for the Civil War reference. There you go. Um, but uh, it really, it's, it's, the book itself is a little academic the way it's written. So it, it might be a little hard for some people to access. 
but um, but the, the message is there though. It really explains, it goes into that psychology and really explains why Washington, you know, latched on to not just Cincinnati, but the, the enlightenment itself. And like Mark was, you know, saying like stoicism and, and just the, the, the concept of restraint, you know, and just like, you know, and, and everything Washington does in his life is pretty much defined by restraint. Even, even as Mark was saying about him on the battlefield, it's probably the only time he really lets loose and becomes unrestrained. And it shows that, you know, he is a man of action and that, you know, he literally, you know, I think it was David McCullough that said that, you know, Washington had, he, he had that capacity where he would not quit. He would not give up no matter the, the you know, the cause or the, the circumstances presented against him. And um, it, again, it shows in his actions, but what the, you know, how did he come to those uh, beliefs? You know, how did he make those decisions in real time? And I think it really just, you know, it shows that he's much more layered than we all give him credit for. You know, Washington can come off as stale, very, you know, even people in the age describe him as, you know, one of the most boring people in the world because he would stand in the room half the time and not really engage anybody, you know, in comparison to other people that were much more uh, forward and, you know, how they uh, interacted. Um, so he got a bad reputation even amongst his peers for that. But it shows a level of restraint, you know, he, he literally listened instead of speaking and he, you know, he thought before he acted and, you know, that's, it just defines him through and through. Yeah. It's like my wife, she says, uh, he's too much of a goody two shoes. Uh, like <laughs> but he's he not though. He really isn't. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a novel idea though. You know, a politician who thinks before he talks and, uh, so is restraint, um, not to stray too far into the 21st century. But. <laughs> so um, I'll pick out my book and I'm actually going to go pick it out of the library because if you know anything about these um, Red War revelries is that I got uh, lampooned uh, the first few weeks because there was nothing but a big white wall behind me. So now that I have a library, um, I'll go to one that just came out. Um, it's not by too much of a big historian. It's used the basketball sports. I only got dressed from the uh, top up. But uh, it's the final year. So it's one by... Uh, mm -hmm. Jonathan Horn there um, really talks about yeah who, who, from 1797 to 1799 a little bit about the family about Martha I mean he's Martha's sons even Thomas Jefferson after mm -hmm. the death um, and so forth talks a little bit about that Washington uh, George actually buys uh, I think two townhomes in Washington to help boost some of the uh, real estate as well um, so he really shows and also too about we always hear him coming back and um, being manipulated by Alexander Hamilton and the quasi war and, and the Adam situations and so forth. Um, and it shows a little bit in there. It shows a little bit of uh, Washington's actually frustrations and um, how it's, he does try to remove himself completely from the public world. But it's also guys struggling to, a, a little bit to realize uh, this is the experiment I helped set up. It's, he's the first one in the United States who got to watch his predecessor come into office and then make decisions that he may or may not have agreed with. And so, and, and also Adams has most of Washington's second cabinet still there um, with James McHenry and Tim uh, Timothy Pickering. So definitely a decent book to pick up um, if you are interested in, uh, once again, not a complete biography, but the last few years. So um, nobody, uh, nobody mentioned, nobody said the Alex, the new Alexis uh, Co book about Washington. Oh, <laughs> oh I don't yeah. know what that is. Yeah, <laughs> it's a new book. Uh, I haven't read it actually, so. I was going to say, oh, I'm sorry, Phil. I was going to say quickly, though, uh, not, I'm not going to go into like second and third and all that, but uh, another book that I did think about uh, mentioning, and, and it was actually some, off of something Mark said, is uh, that book, uh, Imperfect God. I can't remember who wrote it, but it goes into Washington Wiencheck? slavery. What was that? I think it was Henry Wiencheck. Yes. Wiencheck. yes. Yeah. And the reason why I, it, Mark started talking about Washington and, and uh, his relationship with Martha and that book uh, that by uh, WeCheck really goes into not just the upbringing of Washington and, and Virginia, you know, slavery, uh, Virginia and all that, but it also goes into the, the fundamental differences between George and Martha as they grow older and how he becomes kind of a closet abolitionist. And there's no indication that she ever broke from her upbringing as part of the, you know, the Virginia gentry class. And he kind of posits that that might be why Washington didn't do more 
especially towards the end of his life, because he was so entangled, obviously, with Virginia laws at the time, but also entangled with his own marriage. And there was really no way for him to get out of it without completely unraveling, you know, unraveling everything at Mount Vernon. So it, it, it's like I said, it, it's a lot of there is good history there. There is a lot of speculative speculation going on, but it's a good read. I definitely recommend it, especially for that subject. Uh, yeah. And I got a quick thing I want to ask everybody um, uh, as a coda to what Phil said, and that is what is the best site or I guess what's the best monument or memorial to George Washington? Um, and I think it's interesting because uh, we just talked about, you know, Martha and how Washington didn't have any kids, but Mar Washington adopts uh, uh, Martha's kids, the Custis family. Uh, and, uh, you know, after Washington dies, you know, part of the Washington family is going to take Mount Vernon. Um, but his uh, adopted grandson, George Washington Park Custis, is going to build a house, uh, Arlington House, uh, overlooking Washington, D.C. And this is really the first memorial to George Washington. He builds it as a memorial. So it looks like a Greek temple uh, and uh, overlooks the new Washington city and Custis. Uh, he buys up pretty much as much stuff from Martha and George as he can. And he inherits some stuff and he's going to take it all up there uh, and have it on display so that people can come talk to him, learn about George Washington, check out some of his sites, uh, uh, some of the artifacts associated with him. And then his daughter, Custis's daughter, ends up marrying Robert E. Lee. Uh, and then, of course, Lee is going to live there. And then Lee leaves to join the Confederacy. And then Arlington House becomes the center of Arlington National Cemetery. Um, and today, Arlington House is part of the National Park Service. Uh, it's just finishing up a big rehabilitation. And after the coronavirus stuff is over, uh, it's going to be reopening. So uh, I always think it's kind of like the most interesting Washington Memorial Monument because usually we think of the Washington Monument down in DC but it's just a big obelisk uh, that people go in take an elevator up look around but you can actually go to the house that was uh, his adopted grandson's home uh, that was built specifically to memorialize Washington so I always thought that was uh, uh, pretty neat and uh, you know it is the, the first of the, the Washington monuments uh, but there's so many of them like I said all around I just wonder if any of you have any uh, thoughts or ideas of the best places to hear the story of, yeah, the father of the country. I was going to shy away from that question tonight because I knew Mark had his feelings with Arlington House. Being the <laughs> he was teed up for that question. <laughs> yeah. Well, I could wrap this up. Mark threw that in there. So now we got Arlington House. Um, well, I'll pass it over to you guys for the final uh, one place to visit uh, post-pandemic, as Mark said. So I don't know that it would be the one place to visit, but George Washington Park Custis also laid the first memorial to George Washington at the birthplace in 1815. So, uh, and it's left of that, correct? Is that no, gone? No, this is this is the uh, the case of the boulder left out in the elements, left in areas where farmers uh, have to move it, where it's breaking apart and. And there are visitors to the birthplace saying, I need a souvenir. There's no postcard. How about a bit of this monument? Put it that in my pocket. And now, you know, the monument is or the memorial tablet is probably in a thousand homes in across America. People are looking at it going, what the hell is this? I, I don't know if I've ever seen this before. What is it? You know, and so you have to have the backstory. But actually, um, there's not really much of a monument to him there. But Washington Crossing State Park. And the reason why I picked that Which is one? because what's that? Which one? I, I think the Pennsylvania side. Oh, uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I think the Pennsylvania side, I know that the New Jersey side is very cool as well, but it's the Pennsylvania side. And it's, it's thinking on that night of Christmas night, 1776, knowing full well, this is a last roll of the dice, if you will. Seven days from now, he's going to lose, you know, thousands of his army. If this doesn't succeed, you know, as he said in a letter earlier in that month, you know, I fear the game is going to be pretty much up. And so that night, taking longer to get across, right? Supposed to arrive at Trenton at dawn. They're barely in New Jersey at dawn. You know, they got a nine mile march, all of this. Um, that right there, I just think shows, you know, that this is a person who is gonna, he's gonna lay it on the line. He is not going to 
uh, give up. He's going to take that one last shot. And if it fails, it fails. But he wins spectacularly. Nine days later, your triumphant horse scene behind you, Mark, um, at Princeton. And those two battles saved the revolution. And I just, I just love to think about that on that night, on that cold, frigid night. What is going through his head? What is going through the mind of George Washington? And, and you know, I think. I believe Mark's I, book is titled What Was Going Through His Head. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yes, victory or death. All right. But, um, you know, I, I, I think I've heard of that book, but I'm not quite sure who the authors are. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I just I love to think of myself as a soldier, you know, standing there watching, watching him that night, just watching him. Um, just standing there as a stoic, you know, just, you know, not showing any outward signs of emotion, but probably inside churning because he does know this is that last roll on the dice. Yeah, I would, um, I would say uh, Princeton battlefield to stick with my home roots of Jersey um, as, you know, not the, you know, the kind of shift away from actual monuments, if you will, um, just to witness it in, in person Fortunately, you know, we still have some of it. A lot of it has disappeared, unfortunately. But, you know, it's if you get the right if you get the right guide and especially I love going there in wintertime, because if you go there and actually, you know, that that's where the imagination picks it up. You know, it's like going to any battlefield when the actual battle time of year it took place. You know, your imagination really takes over for you and you can start trying to like you were just saying, Scott, like, you know, put yourself in the shoes of soldiers that actually were there and, and doing this and that. Um, so that's powerful. But honestly, if, for me personally, the real testament, the real monument is, is having these discussions because keeping him alive and keep and, and that doesn't even have to be Washington, it can be anybody in American history, but just keeping him alive through our, these discussions, through reading about him, that is, that is what is needed because that is what so many people unfortunately don't do. And they have a really warped understanding of who he was. It's, it's usually very misinformed. And that's why you have people, unfortunately, trying to tear statues down because it's, you know, there's a lot of anger out there, but it's not routed the right way. And when you have, when you have bad education and you just have misinformation, that's unfortunately, you know, how it expresses itself. So I just look at it as, you know, the best thing we can do as a monument, really, as a country is to honestly teach him and also honestly say this is what he did and this is what he didn't do and i'm not asking you to like him but i'm asking you to understand him and i think if we can if we can you know all of us just do that part you know it, it goes back to what i should tell my students all the time when i teach him in class or whoever it's just like my job is not to tell you to like this person my job is strictly to teach you about this person it's on you to make the ultimate decision whether you want to you know, follow through and, and have feelings beyond just knowing about them. And I, I just feel like that is the ultimate monument to somebody like Washington, especially Washington out of all Americans that, you know, we need to know who he was because if we let that slip, we're, we are letting our own identity slip too, because Washington is the United States, you know, warts and all, but he really is. I mean, he, he is the nucleus that will never be removed. Um, and for good, for better or worse, uh, he's there for a reason, and we should know why. Great points, Adam. I'll uh, actually build off a little bit about uh, from that and pick a place that actually is a monument and also is very underappreciated, uh, I think, for uh, Washington is uh, Morristown, uh, Morristown, New Jersey. There's a great monument for uh, George Washington there. Um, I got the chance to spend a few months there working uh, for the National Park Service. Um, it's the place where, I mean, the not first inoculations of the army, I mean, drastically going through at Morristown, where it creeps to, uh, I think, after uh, training Princeton, if I um, remember correctly. Um, it's also where, um, I mean, if you want to throw Mark's favorite guy, Alexander Hamilton, into it, where he uh, meets uh, the Schuyler's uh, uh, daughter there. Uh, but it also, I mean, is a, uh, it's, a, it's a chance for a, a town that did so much that is underappreciated for what Washington used it for. Um, I mean, you go to Morristown now, it's a gateway of uh, New York City, uh, but it is a part that uh, has a, it does have a monument. So you can see Washington on the horse, looking out of it down, it does have the house, it does have the encampment. Um, and it's um, a place that, yeah, kind of 
uh, the Army uses as a safe haven. As he said, it's where Washington spends more time during the war than anywhere else. Um, so we're always fascinated with where Washington slept. He slept here. Well, he slept in Morristown more often in the seven or eight years of the war than anywhere else. So definitely a place to, uh, to visit. Um, and uh, you can get that fit selfie with the Washington Monument or the Washington on a horse as well there. So um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, we are running a little uh, after time. So we appreciate people sticking with us for uh, more than an hour. Obviously, Washington, you can talk about forever. Uh, but let's like keep going. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> but, uh, well, maybe we can do another one coming up uh, for um, about Mary Ball or something. We can, if we can still do this next May. Hopefully, we're still not under the COVID pandemic next May. But um, uh, there's Mother's Day in, what, 11 months away. So, But um, with Brad Mazinski, Scott Hill, um, and Mark Malloy, thank you for joining uh, us at Red Bull Revelry. Uh, this is an uh, ongoing Sunday evening tradition, uh, slowly becoming. So... We will be back next Sunday with another topic, so we hope you tune in there. But for the rest of your Father's Day or weekend, enjoy it. Uh, be safe, and we'll see you next Sunday. So thank you all for tuning in, and thank you, gentlemen, for joining us here this evening.